Okay, cue the theme music. We all live in a yellow submarine. A yellow submarine. Okay, today we're going to talk about interference. We've been talking about ray optics, and now we're going to start considering what happens when we remember that light is actually a wave. So uh, we're going to just do a little review of the idea of interference. We've dealt with it when we uh, did the unit on waves. And so just imagine, if you will, I have, I'm making water waves. Imagine you're hovering over Utah Lake with a big stick, and you're moving the stick up and down and making ripples propagate on the water. Well, what if you had two sticks some distance apart, and you made them move up and down together? Well, what we get is just the sum of the waves made by the two sticks, right? So you get something like that. And there are certain places where these waves will they'll cancel each other out. When one wave's going up, the other one's going down, and you get no waviness there. In other places, the two waves are in phase and you get really big oscillations. So in some regions will get destructive interference, other regions will get constructive interference. All right, And we call this pattern of constructive and destructive interference an interference pattern, surprisingly enough. So imagine, if you will, here's a wave propagating from one source. Here's a very low resolution numerical calculation of a wave. If I add another wave in and add them together, it looks like this. And you see right down the middle, the two waves have to travel the same distance to get to this point, so they're going to be in phase with each other, and they're going to make a big wave. All right, Over here, the wave coming from this source travels a shorter distance than the wave coming from this source, so when they arrive at this point, they're half a wavelength out of phase, and they cancel out, and you get a dark fringe right here. Over here, in the middle of this, you get a bright fringe again, where this distance and this distance is an entire wavelength, so this one gets out of phase with that one by an entire 360 degrees, which means they're back in phase again, and you get constructive interference. All right, So that's how an interference pattern forms. Now, you get interference patterns when you make water waves, as I discussed, but you can also make interference patterns with light. And in fact, this is how we know that light is a wave. The first experiment that really proved that light is a wave was done by making an interference pattern like this. Of course, later on, quantum mechanics came along and told us light's not really a wave, but that's another story for another day and another unit. So for now, light is a wave, and what do waves do? They interfere. So if I have two waves, if I have a sine wave and another sine wave, and they're in phase with each other, they both go up at the same time, they both go down at the same time, I get constructive interference and these two waves add together to make a big wave. Notice if I shift this wave by one wavelength, everything moves over, I still have constructive interference. So constructive interference will happen whenever I have two, if I have two sources that are, that are making identical waves, if I look at some point where the distance, the difference in those two distances, we call this S1, S2, if the difference between those two distances, if the absolute value of those distances is equal to zero, or one wavelength, or two wavelengths, or an integer number of wavelengths, we will get constructive interference, and those two waves will add together to make a big wave. All right? Now, I get destructive interference when the two waves are 180 degrees out of phase. So if I have a wave like this, and I add it to a wave like that, here, this one's going up when this one's going down, they cancel out. This one's going down when this one's going up, they cancel out. This one's zero, when this one's zero, oh, you get zero, okay? So the two waves cancel each other out. Now, if I have two sources that are making identical sine waves, and I look some dis at some point, all right, and these two waves interfere, I will get perfect destructive interference if this wave, if one of the waves is 180 degrees out of phase with the other, all right? That happens when, if I call this distance S1 and S2, if the difference between those two distances is equal to half a wavelength, or three halves of a wavelength, or five halves of a wavelength, or n plus one half times a wavelength, then I will get destructive interference. Only you know what? I'm not going to call uh, my integer n because then we get confused with index of refraction. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to call my index of refraction. I'm going to call my integer here m, so I can save n for the index of refraction if that's okay. All right, so if the distance, the difference that these two waves travel before they come together is an integer number of wavelengths, we get perfect constructive interference. 
if the distance is an integer number, is a half integer number of wavelengths, we get destructive interference. Somewhere in between, we get partial constructive interference. All right? Okay, so now let's consider what, how I would make interference with light. All right? So what you do is you take a bunch of light. Imagine I have a plane wave, light from a laser, for example and I shine it onto a card and that card has two little slits in it so it only lets light come through these two little places right here. So I have a little electric field that's oscillating up and down in this slit and one in this slit. Now this electric field that's oscillating up and down it's going to send out waves that go in all directions. All right? But the light coming through this slit is also going to send out waves going in all directions. And if you look right down the middle you see these two correspond with each other. When they're going up, they're both going up. When one's going down, the other one's going down. So right along here, there's a line in which they're both in phase with each other, and you get constructive interference. Right here, along this line, when one is down, the other one's up. When one is up, the other one's down. You get perfect destructive interference. So along this line here, you get perfect destructive. Along this line here, you get perfect constructive interference. Along this line here, you get perfect destructive, and so forth. And so you get, you see these yellow lines show you where you have perfect constructive interference. So if you shine your light through these two slits, you will make a pattern on your wall of bright and dark fringes. All right? From that interference, you know that light's a wave. And in fact, if you know the spacing between those two slits and you look at that pattern, you can actually figure out what the wavelength of that light is. So two slits, and I can get lots and lots of bright and dark fringes on my wall, an interference pattern. We'll show you an example of that in class. Okay, but how can I calculate where I'm going to get the bright spots? So imagine, if you will, I put a sheet of paper right here, and I shine my interference, and I want to know, do I get a bright spot or a dark spot or somewhere in between at this point on my paper? Well, it all comes down to how far did the light have to travel from the two sources. I'm adding the light from this source to light from this source. If the difference between these two lengths is an integer number of wavelengths, I'm going to get perfect constructive interference. If it's a half integer number of wavelengths, I'm going to get perfect destructive interference. I'm going to get a dark fringe. All right? So I just need to do a little bit of trigonometry. Well, we're going to make our trigonometry much simpler by assuming that instead of putting a screen right here or a wall or a piece of paper, I'm going to assume that my wall that I'm projecting my fringes on is a long ways away, a long distance compared to the spacing between my slits and compared to the wavelength of the light. When I do that, Right? I have light going off to, my, to some point on my wall from this slit and light going from this slit. And if my wall is like really, really far away, in the limit that my wall is infinitely far away, these two lines that meet on my wall are actually going to be parallel. Right, Parallel lines meet at infinity. So in the limit as my wall where I look at my fringes is further and further away, these two lines, these two rays that go to that point on that wall um, are closer and closer to being parallel lines. And in the limit as my wall goes to infinity, they are parallel lines. Why is that nice? Well, if I have parallel lines, if I just draw a line right here, which is perpendicular to these two lines, the difference in the two paths is just that line right there, right? So what I'm really doing is I'm saying, look, these two lines go out and they meet at a point. The distance from here out to there and the distance from there out to my line is the same. So I have an isosceles triangle and then I have this extra distance right here. So these two lines go out, these three lines make an isosceles triangle, and then I have this extra distance right here. So the difference in the paths between these two contributions of light, if I look out on my screen and I say I'm adding light from this slit to this slit, the difference in the length that those two contributions to my light have traveled is just this thing right here, delta s. And what is delta s equal to? Well, if I'm looking off on my screen a distance theta above the optical axis, all right? Now, do I measure theta relative to this slit, this slit, or in the middle? Well, once again, my screen is far away, so this distance is really small, negligible for measuring these things. But if I look off, I have my slits, and I look off at some angle theta, all right? The dis difference in the two paths is just going to be, well, if that's theta, you can convince yourself this angle here is also theta. And if the distance, the separation between my two slits is, what should we call it? Let's call it d. If my two slits are separated by a distance d, that distance right there, well, this is just a right 
triangle, right? And here's the hypotenuse. This is the opposite side. And so that means that this distance is just d times sine of theta. There we go. So if I look off at some angle theta, the distance, the difference in those two paths is just d sine theta. All right, to get constructive interference, I just need that distance, d sine theta, to be equal to an integer number of wavelengths. For destructive interference, I just need d sine theta, that distance, to be equal to a half integer number of wavelengths. And there you have it, and there's the equation that, that there are the equations that tell you where, at what angles you will get bright and dark fringes from your two slit interference pattern. Okay, now, here I'm going to show you some Morier patterns, all right? So you can kind of figure out where fringes will form simply by drawing a bunch of concentric circles, make a transparency, make two transparencies, and put them on top of each other, and you can slide them. You can say, oh, if I have a source here and a source here, so here's, you know, it's like I shine my laser and I have my two slits here. If I have a source here and a source here, here's where I see constructive interference. When the two lines are out of phase with each other, that's where you get destructive, constructive, destructive. So but just by drawing circles and putting them together, you can figure out, you can make a, a picture of what your interference pattern will be like. These are called Morier patterns. Also, you can also get interference if I have two plane waves on top of each other, all right? So there's our fringes playing around. Here I have two plane waves, and they're right on top of each other. If I change their phase relative to one another, I can get constructive, destructive, constructive, destructive interference and such. Now watch what happens when I rotate one of my waves. All right, so if one of my waves is going a little bit down, one's going a little bit up, I get bright a pattern of bright and dark fringes. All right, so here's using lines, using a Morier pattern to figure out where your fringes would form. Now, why don't you see an interference pattern from two light bulbs? Well, it has to do with something we call coherence, and there's two types of coherence, temporal and spatial. All right? Temporal coherence basically says, is your wave really a sine wave or is it doing goofy things in time? All right, so light from a light bulb is really made up of lots of different colors. So if I have two light bulbs and have them interfere with each other, first of all, there's lots of different colors, all right? And so you're gonna get lots of different interference patterns at different colors. Plus, not only that, the two light bulbs, they're uncorrelated with each other. So if you look at any given color, kind of the phase of that color is randomly changing between the light bulbs. So your interference patterns are jumping all over the place and washing themselves out. So that's one reason you don't see interference from two light bulbs. Another problem is spatial coherence. If I have a light bulb, I've got this filament, right? This little piece of the filament is going to uh, make one set of waves, and this is going to make another. And for example, imagine that instead of using a laser, what if I, what if I have two slits here and I illuminate it with a light bulb, all right? This little piece of the light bulb is going to make interference in a different way than this little piece of the light bulb, and things are going to wash out. So if you want to see interference fringes you know, this way, you need something that uh, comes basically from a single point, a point source. A laser beam is a good virtual point source. Another thing you need is if is you, it's really nice if you have just one color. Otherwise, you'll get the first interference fringe in the middle where everything lines up, and then they'll all start to destructively interfere, but as you go out to higher and higher order fringes, bigger and bigger M, right, my M lambda, then one color of red will be constructive, a slightly different color of red will be destructive there, and things kind of wash out to gray, all right? So a laser beam is special because it has coherence. It's only one color, and it's basically a virtual point source, which makes interferometry, do doing interference stuff, really nice with lasers, harder to do with other sources of light. But it turns out anytime you have coherence, interference happens. For example, oh, well, polarization. We'll talk about polarization later, but it turns out to get interference, your two sources have to have the same polarization. But that's a topic for another lecture. I don't know why I even brought that up. In my graduate work, we made something called a Bose-Einstein condensate, and it's basically coherent matter, kind of like laser beams are coherent light we had coherent matter, where the quantum waves of this little cloud of sodium atoms, it was kind of one wave. All of the atoms shared the same quantum phase. They were just like one sine wave. So we made two of these Bose condensates, and we let them go. We, let the, we, we had them in a trap, and we just let them go, fly into each other, 
And as the gas from the two different clouds came together, guess what we saw? Interference fringes. Here's a three-dimensional rendering I did of that that actually made the cover of science. So anytime you have coherence, interference shows up. And interference tells you what you're looking at is a wave.